rogue and free-floating planets. If nature finds it very easy to form lots of uh, these brown dwarfs, and we're finding more and more of them the more we look, then surely it must be able to make smaller objects more easily again. And so perhaps we should expect to find small sub brown dwarf sized objects out there, sort of large gas giants like Jupiter in great abundance, wandering the, uh, the galaxy. This reminds me of this uh, 1951 movie, When Worlds Collide. Actually, this was when a, the plot was when a, a rogue star called Belus swept through the solar system and destroyed the Earth. And mankind had to build this, build this magnificent rocket ship that you see in the picture here and launch it from a track as a kind of space arc to go to the uh, fictional planet Zyra that was supposed to be in orbit around Belus. And uh, of course, the good guys won and they made it. So, plot spoiler for you. But, uh, but we might not get any warning of an object like this coming our way. We might get an interstellar visitor, linking back to that other topic of things that come in from deep space, uh, that might be a rather larger than your typical asteroid and could just be a giant planet sized object. It would be really quite tricky to spot at any distance until it was uh, coming upon us. Um, and certainly could be so large that we wouldn't be able to deflect it. Now, people have come up with different terms for these rogue or free floating planets that orbit the galaxy on their own without an accompanying parent star. Uh, other terms used interstellar planet, nomad planet, wandering planet. I hate that one because planet means wanderer in Greek, so it's a wandering wanderer. Orphan planet, well, that implies it had a parent and it's lost it, which might not be true. Starless or sunless planet, mm. and the worst of all, planemo, I really hate that. So I call them rogue planets, which makes them sound much more intriguing. And of course, there are two possibilities. One is that they could have formed completely independently of any star system, uh, just in the same way that stars form, but on a smaller scale out of a collapsing nebula. Or they could have been formed in a solar system and then ejected from it by a near miss or a slingshot effect with uh, one of the other objects in that system. So perhaps they might be formed independently. We might have these sub brown dwarf sized objects. They didn't reach that 13 Jupiter mass limit to be called a brown dwarf because they can't trigger nuclear fusion in the core. That's one possible thing. Or they could be ejected by the chaotic orbits in uh, a complicated solar system early on. This can happen especially if you had perhaps a binary star system that had formed a, a bunch of planets as well. One of them could have a near miss with one of the binary companions and be shot out into deep space on a parabolic orbit or a hyperbolic orbit, never to return. So can we detect these uh, rogue planets out there roaming the galaxy? Well, we could try and image them directly. Um, the uh, other way of doing it might be to look using the method we use for planets that uh, orbit other stars. Well, those are in the main, the Doppler shift caused to the parent star when there's a planet orbiting it. So we can't use that because there is no parent star in attendance. And the transit method where we see them move across the face of their parent star and block out some of the light that's discovered some 5,000 planets using that method now. Um, well, again, no parent star, so we can't do it. We're going to have to try and spot them directly. And we've got a couple of telescopes up there that are very good at this because they're infrared telescopes. There's Spitzer and there's uh, the Wide Field Infrared Telescope called WISE. 
and both of these are very good at looking for the infrared signature of a warm object against the cold of space. And you guessed it, they've done it. OTS 44 is a sub brown dwarf, quite a large one. It's uh, 11.5 times the mass of Jupiter. Um, uh, so just below that brown dwarf limit. And it's quite big, it's 25% the radius of the sun. So it might well be that it's a, a dust disk or protoplanetary disk in the process of forming still. And it's quite warm with a temperature of 2000 degrees. So uh, this is either a brown dwarf with a dust ring around it or potentially a proto star that has not yet reached the density to uh, kick off nuclear fusion. So it's either a failed star or it hasn't really had time yet. Slightly smaller, we found an eight solar mass object, just 1.8 times the radius of Jupiter. So this is a planet. This is a gas giant planet, quite a large super Jupiter. And it's uh, 163 light years away and being directly imaged. And again, seems to have a, a dust ring around it. So maybe in the process of forming its own planetoid or moon systems orbiting around this free-floating separate planet. We've got a couple that are fairly nearby the Sun. Again, nearby ones are easier to detect. The little animation there is the uh, Weezer 0855 object, which is a five Jupiter mass planet. Again, 1.8 times the radius of Jupiter. Um, so definitely a planet. Fairly cold, 250 degrees Kelvin, so hotter than Jupiter, that's 125. And so it's definitely, uh, you know, quite a big object, so a certain amount of trapped heat in the center still. And it's fairly nearby, 7.3 light years away, puts it in our, our solar system's backyard, this one. Um, and possible water clouds in the upper layers of it. So very interesting object indeed. And another Weezer discovery, I won't read out the number, is a binary brown dwarf with two fairly large objects, uh, 35 and 45 masses of Jupiter. Now that's also in our backyard, but those are definitely brown dwarfs rather than a, uh, a rogue planet. And you can see the little map of the sun Ewart Cloud and Alpha and Proxima Centauri system at just over four light years, Barnard Star, a red dwarf at six light years, and then uh, we've got these, these other objects that are not that far away. Um, too far away to be the Nemesis object though. But uh, the list here, I'm not going to go through this, but just shows there's OTS 44 that we mentioned and the uh, the Weezer objects there that we've talked about, but it's quite a long list of potential free-floating planets. And you can see the masses are anything from um, two times the mass of Jupiter up to uh, the point where they're really becoming brown dwarfs. And the way that we've uh, also been able to do a bit of a survey for these it's a very clever trick called gravitational micro lensing. This is a bit like the transit method, except it doesn't rely on the planet being in orbit around the star. It can be any background star. If it crosses in front of the line of sight, then Einstein's relativity tells us that the uh, path of the light from the background star will be focused slightly as a lens, a gravitational lens by the gravity of the passing planet. And it's a strong enough effect that it can cause a, a significant change in the overall brightness. Suddenly rather more of the light gets delivered to the telescope. And you can see a detection curve along the bottom there where a particular uh, star was being monitored and then suddenly brightened by just over a whole magnitude and then faded away again 
in a neat symmetrical uh, bell-shaped curve as the wandering object moved in front of it. And that was a detection of a planet and we can estimate the mass of the planet by the uh, size and shape of the uh, curve and we can estimate how fast it's moving as well. The trouble is we can only generally catch this particular object once because it's not in orbit, it's not going to come round and do the same thing again and the chance of the same object being able to be identified passing another star, uh, well, it's just hopeless. So we really only get to see them once. But what we can do is count how many of these events we see. We've been getting better at it. And you can see that the first objects were detected back in the early 90s, 1993. We detected a micro lensing event. But now there's more than a thousand of these being detected. And it can also detect very small planets, not uh, much larger than the Earth. And there's one or two that are around five times the mass of the Earth, which uh, makes them a lot, lot smaller than Jupiter. And it's very useful to be able to do this to get some idea of the mix of sizes and um, numbers of these rogue planets wandering around the Milky Way. Um, from a health and safety point of view, they're a bit of a menace. Um, but from a science point of view, they're also very useful because we've been able to prove that they don't add up to enough mass to account for the problem that's attributed to what we call dark matter. The fact that the orbital velocities of stars in galaxies are too fast for the amount of mass that uh, should be keeping them in orbit. That's another whole story. But this is just another piece of evidence towards it. And of course, we have this idea that in our solar system, early on when it was forming, it probably began with five giant planets. Um, but as Jupiter was growing and picking up all the material around it, it spiraled inwards until it got into a resonant two to one orbital period relationship with Saturn. And then bad things happen here it starts with five planets and all the Kuiper belt objects in green and here one of them gets kicked out and we end up with the four giant planets that we know today uh, and all the Kuiper belt objects rather scattered so here it is with the neat Kuiper belt again it runs and then here the interaction happens and one of the planets gets thrown out and in fact <coughs> when we run computer simulations this is pretty much the only way that we can get the uh, simulation to come out looking right. So it's quite probable that they, uh, a fifth giant planet existed and got hurled out of the solar system. Whether it hur was hurled far enough to escape completely or not, we can't tell. It might still be out there. And if it is, maybe this is part of the evidence for it. This is some of the scattered disk objects out at the outer reaches of the Kuiper belt. We've discovered Sedna and then a few other Sedna-like objects in these long elliptical orbits that carry them around the sun in periods like 10,000 years for the orbit period. Um, and there's something curious. This diagram is correct. All of their orbits point outwards to one side of the solar system and have their close approach on the other side. And the only way we've thought of to account for this is there might be a ninth giant planet out there orbiting the Sun controlling all of this that we just haven't discovered and again harks back a little bit to the nemesis hypothesis of a, of a Sun's uh, companion only this time we're talking about something with planetary mass not brown dwarf or stellar mass but it still could be a significant player in the long history of the solar system um, but we don't know that it's there and surveys are beginning to rule it out beginning to narrow down the range of possibilities it's either too far away or too small for the surveys to detect 
um, and as time goes on the possibility for it to be significant is dwindling away. So that's the story of uh, rogue planets. Thank you very much for listening to that one and as I said it links together with the uh, brown dwarf and interstellar talks uh, quite nicely I think because the the three are really quite strongly related. <laughs>